Hello. Uh, today we're working on my stream stimulator. So we, this is a programming stream. Programming streams are boring. Um, and so to keep people uh, engaged, give them something to do, give them something to look at, uh, we're re-implementing the Windows 95 screensaver. Uh, the like maze thing. Uh, so right now we have this, let's see if I can pull it up. <clears throat> uh, we have this, oh my gosh, which one is it this way? Here we go. We have this procedurally generated maze. Um, if I like close this and reopen it, it'll be a different maze this time. It's hard to remember, but this is different. Um, and when you hit play, the guy walks through the maze, he does like that like silly little slow rotate that happens in the original screensaver. Um, and where we got to last stream was this point where he walks around and every time he goes through a tile, he picks, uh, he picks like a random direction. And he like does this like rotation, translation, etc. Um, there was some things I implemented off screen, uh, because they were boring and easy to fix and kind of fun to just do casually. So, uh, I learned a little GD script and previously there were like a bunch of member functions that I wasn't really super happy with. So let's get this guy sitting over in the corner. Let's just move this guy over here. That. Uh, so there were previously some things I like, wasn't really happy with. Uh, specifically, uh, I thought that GD script had every function had to be a member function of a class because scripts are uh, all a single class. Uh, but they, I found that they do in fact have static class functions, which means that they're just like normal functions, but they still are attached to the namespace of the class. Good enough. Um, I prefer free functions or static functions to like class functions because I don't like the concept that like every function could just change my class state and there's too much state to try to keep track of. It's easier for me if I handle inputs and outputs and then assign those to class members explicitly in like a few small select places. So did that. Uh, there was a poorly named function previously. Let's see if I can find it. I think it was here in maze. I had a function that was like a trans transformation from grid coordinates. So like in my map, each location in the map is like a specific integer coordinate. Let's see if I can like see here. So this would be like zero, zero, one, zero, one, one. Uh, but in Godot, these are like 3D coordinates in the world. Uh, so we had a function to call, we called grid transform, and I didn't really have like a good handle on what that transform was doing exactly. Uh, but it was converting, it was calling, let's see if we can find it. Um, no, it's in maze. So it's basically just taking the transform of the maze and up converting the coordinate to that space. And so here it's, this transform that I'm multiplying by is the local space of this node with respect to the parent node. And so since that's well documented, we can now just rename this to like from this silly grid transform to grid cord to local cord. And I think that's like a fine name. Um, what else did I do? I introduced some linting. So give me one sec. Let's just pop up in the development environment. Do, 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 do. Uh, now, if I run this lint script, uh, it will use this project called, I think, GD, I don't see it. Uh, where do I define this? Nix shell, probably. This project called GD Toolkit, which is, I think, I'm just on GitHub. GitHub. Yeah, this guy. 
So if somebody has implemented like a code formatter in linter, etc. Um, I'm not really too picky about code style when I'm writing, but I do prefer some form of consistency. And I know that if I were to just write by hand, I wouldn't be consistent. So having like a formatter that does what it applies consistent rules and a linter that tells me that I'm not uh, using GD script correctly, uh, that's great and useful. Um, I also validate on push that like this is this lint script is run on push, so I can't commit or I can't like upload changes before they've been thoroughly validated. Um, what else did we do? Uh, the rotation in the previous stream was incorrectly defined so let's just pull this up so here in this like physics process script they give us like a delta which is like how much time has applied between the last frame and this frame and i just wasn't using this in rotation so just added some like rotation times deltas in a couple spots and uh bef previously the uv coordinates i struggled with those a little bit so let's just pull open this guy and I was like manually moving these around and I wasn't doing it consistently um so I had some of these were actually like rotated 180 degrees which meant that they didn't line up with each other um and they were also kind of like scaled like this because I wanted smaller bricks um but what I want to do is I want to create like a proper texture for these that is what I want instead of just like copy pasting something from the internet so uh what I've done is I have found this button that you can press in blender where I can go from here and I can click on a single face in edit mode. I can look at it from the front and I can say project from view bounce. And so if I press that button, it will just snap the, f the corners of what I'm looking at to the corners of the UV. Easy peasy. Uh, so that's actually like exactly what I wanted and I should have done that last stream. But here we are. So fix those. Um, I used a Bad, a bad trick, <laughs> I guess. Bad is the wrong word. I use this trick where in the constructor of my maze, I had an argument that matched the member variable name. Um, and I disambiguated this before by putting an underscore somewhere. Uh, but you can disambiguate it with self like in Python. So I did that. Uh, the reason is that I want I don't want this to have an underscore either in the member variable use or in the arguments for the constructor. And I like... Theoretically, these are exposed to a caller, so having underscores in them is like a little annoying for them. You see it in autocomplete, uh, so it's just kind of nicer to have this like this. And I renamed like a, the game top level class to something more sane, Maze Walker, because this isn't a game. You can't play anything. Okay, so what I want to do today, let's make a new little to do pad. All right, and we'll stick this up here. And so, to do. So first we you need to fix the path planning algorithm. So right now it, uh, how do I say this? It randomly chooses a direction on each tile for how it wants to go. But that means that if you have like a long hallway, like we're seeing right here, he actually just gets stuck because uh, as he keeps going down, each tile he has a 50% chance of just turning all the way back around. And so it's actually just very likely that he just goes back and forth forever. Really what we should do is we should wait. Um, we should wait the uh, choice of direction to prefer going forward, right? And we should only forward or sideways. And we should only turn around if there's literally no other option. Um, then it's, I wanted to have like a start and end goal or like a start and location on the map. Uh, because as it is right now, uh, it's kind of like deceiving. You're like wandering through this maze, but it never ends. And like part of the satisfaction of watching these is seeing the completion once in a while. And so here I just want to 
add the start and location and a game and or a like success screen. And so I think what I want to do is like have one of those like silly transition effects from Windows Movie Maker in 2000. Like Movie Maker transitions. 2000. Right, they had these like. Let's see. Oh, I don't want like a tutorial. I just want to like see one. They had these like really like cookie cutter. Yeah, like this type of thing where they just like great just slide some effect over the screen. I think it'd be kind of fun to just say like we did it and then go through one of these like silly little transitions. Um, and I'd like to explore how I would implement that in Godot. Um, okay, and then if we get through all that, uh, make it look better. So it obviously does not look good. Um, and so things I wanted to explore here were like low resolution to make it kind of match the 95 Windows 95 look. I maybe wanted to explore uh, posts, like making it uh, rendered out of text. So uh, I think, hold on, I think I have an example somewhere. I think I have an example somewhere. So let's see if I have anything interesting in my pictures folder. Right, so here, here is an example of the Windows 95 screensaver captured on YouTube. And then here is an ASCII rendered version of it. And I think it'd be kind of fun to do something like that uh, in a Godot shader because uh, it just kind of like feels more programmy. It's kind of mixing like the fact that like we're typing a bunch with like this old retro effect, kind of fun all around. Um, and then I also wanted to explore uh, generating my own procedural seamless tile. Uh, so right now we just kind of have this like brick texture that we stole from, I think somebody drawing the bricks from Super Mario Bros. Uh, and I'd prefer to have something that like I hand rolled myself. And I think that we can do, we can start getting a little uh, interesting there. Because if I look, if you look at like this guy, he does have, he's not just like flat, right? He's got like some normal mapping on here. Uh, the ceiling or the ground has this like gray brick texture that has like some clear noise in there. Uh, so it could be kind of fun to just kind of play around with seeing what looks good. Uh, so yeah, so that's the plan for today. So we'll say we are here. All right, it's fine. We'll just move the to-do list down as we go. Um, yeah. And we'll just say that we're using Godot here. Maybe we expand all of this a little bit. Just so that it's a little bit more visible. Oh. Can I clip the top of this down a little bit more? What if I pause it when I'm sitting up? There we go. Easy peasy. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay. Let's get moving. So let's start. I think this is in the maze walker script. So what do we do? We get our grid. Can I like make this bigger? So we look at our current coordinate in grid space. We look at our desired grid coordinate and we check what our available neighbors are. We then say our desired grid coordinate is like what one of those. And so probably what we want to do here is we want to see check which direction are we facing right now and which direction like are any of these neighbors that direction. And if so, we'll filter them out. Um, so let's think about this. Func so let's factor this out into a function. Pick desired neighbor. Or we'll say pick desired coordinate. Um, 
And here we just go like this, stick it in here. And we say here we want to, uh, well, first we want to make this a static function because it shouldn't use any class state. Um, what does he take in? He takes in, he's using maze, he takes in our grid coordinate. And I think that's it. So here I should be able to say desired grid cord is pick desired cord like this. And something in here is not liked. I can't exact I can't access desired grid cords, right? So I just return this instead. And if I restart this, cool, it's still working. Let's stick it back in the corner here. Um, so now we need to say, so if we only have one option, we just return that option because we're going to filter one out. And if we filter the only option out and then remove it, oh, then we'll have a zero size list and we won't be able to find anything. So let's just say if available neighbors dot size equals one return available neighbors zero and uh it doesn't like this no it's good okay so now i can say um available neighbors is filter out backwards wait filter out backwards neighbor and so there we probably have to take in the neighbors as well as our uh, which way we're facing in grid cord space. So uh, direction, uh, do we need that? Direct, no, because we can actually just extract that from the camera. Um, so all we need is available neighbors. And we'll create a new function here. And the default behavior should be the unimplemented behavior is just return everything and not work. But we can now test that if we restart the game, solid, nothing crashes, we're chilling. Okay, so now we need to check which way we're facing, which we know we can do with this. And then we just check which of these is closest to the coordinates transform from of each neighbor. So we can say uh, for neighbor got to think about this let's think about this so we iterate over the neighbors right then here we say we check if we want to find which one is closest. So how do we find that? We look at the the direction of that, so that's this. So var neighbor direction is this. Um, neighbor master position. So we need to look at our current position. So we pass that in here. like this, and then like this. And we just call this neighbor for neighbor and neighbors. Neighbor mask to position. Uh, 
Is this actually what we want? What's grid cord to local cord? We need to just pass it as a specific thing. So we actually want to turn this into a neighbor position in grid space. Var neighbor position grid space is this. Neighbor mask to position, so our current and available neighbors. Is this our mask right now? Can I just hit play here? And what is this? These are directions in grid space. So here I can just add that to the current grid cord. Var neighbor position equals grid cord plus neighbor. So we'll just call this available neighbor relative positions grid. <laughs> That's so bad. We'll just call it available neighbors. And we'll comment that this is in grid space. Available neighbors is a array of vector 2i representing relative position in grid space. There we go. So now we have the coordinates, so we can just say we can get the position. Hmm. Let's think about this. We actually don't need to add this to the grid coordinate because we this we only care about the direction we're looking. So we can actually just use them directly. Um, so here I check the cord, local cord of the neighbor like this. Oh shit. Here we go. And now we can just check if that's close to the look direction. So we can say if look direction dot neighbor direction so we say if, we're, if the dot product of these is very high is like greater than 0 0.95 we or i guess we say if it's if we're not almost that exact angle then we will add that to the output. So we say here var red is a new array and we say red dot push back neighbor and we return red. Okay, and let's see if this does anything. Okay, so too many arguments, yep. And restart and neighbor master positions Oops, I wasn't supposed to remove that earlier. Wasn't paying attention. Okay, so here, let's step through this and see what it does. So my available neighbors are zero, zero and one, one. I don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, but let's, can we step? Hello? Oh, cannot call get node on a null value. What doesn't it like? Is this because it's a static function? Let's try this again. Okay, let's just remove the statics. I don't think this is it, but let's just see. Oh, it is. I guess that makes sense. But then how come these guys could use the maze? How come I could use maze but not static? What the heck? Oh, maybe because this is a non-static function. Gross. Uh, but that's okay. We can just pass in the look direction. I guess that's actually what... That's actually, like, really good. We That's <laughs> preferable to how we would do this. So we call this look direction like if if a static function could use member nodes that would suck so i'm okay with this 
Um, so where's this pick desired chord used again? Here. So we'll just move this guy up here and we'll say, we'll pass this in here like this. This guy now passes in like this and like this. Propagated that all the way down. And so now I should be able to restart this and have nothing happen. Okay. So let's see if his movement is reasonable. So he has two options and it should filter out one of them. So can we step through this method? Get node. Oh, fine. Fine, 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 fine. We will pass in the map. Like this, like this, like this. And that way it is clear. Let's try it. Grid quote. So he needs. Oh, an object map. There's no grid cord to local cord. Because we're passing in the maze, not the map. So I'll call this maze. Just do a bunch of renaming like this. Restart. Okay. So he's moved one. No, we are seeing invalid index negative one. Okay, so that means that this dot product is, this is returning false too often. So let's start by just all, like, let's make sure that this logic is correct. So moves one, two, nice. I'm gonna increase the speed for testing because this is really boring to watch. So we'll just do four, eight or something. Let's see. Oh yeah, he's moving. He is moving. Okay, so let's, now we need to see why this isn't working. So uh, let's just print out the dot product here. So look direction dot neighbor direction. And let's just kind of see what this looks like. Okay. So these are never very close to zero. Can I do this? So, oops. So look direction here should also be normalized. So I thought that the one of these, oh, these are one of, they do it close to one. they do never really seem to be as high as I would have thought. Like 0.92? Why is that so high? So let's, let's look at what these are. Uh, neighbor direction, look direction. Um... So our neighbor direction is, interestingly, not aligned with one of the actual axes. That's weird. Our look direction is aligned with an axis. That makes sense. So why is our neighbor direction so messed up? Let's look at what neighbor is. Zero, one, two, three, zero. So why is this three, one? What are these? These are the grid coordinates of the neighbor. Oh, these are like actual grid coordinates. So these aren't relative. 
which means that we actually do need our existing coordinate. So, so we'll call this a uh, neighbor. So the grid coordinate has to be, uh, we need the direction from neighbor minus grid cord. And then here we just have to pass this in everywhere. So this guy comes in here. Oh, that's it. Okay. 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 There he did turn around. Oh, but that's because I'm not actually filtering. Okay. Let's see. So sometimes our directions are, they're still not like close to one. I don't really understand that. Um, so let's do this. Let's print neighbor minus grid cord, right? We, we can expect this to be... Okay, so that's good. They are always negative one or one. So why is neighbor direction... Like one of these axes? Like why is y ever not zero? Why is y ever anything here because our neighbor should always be aligned on the y plane which means that this is doing something wrong let's un take off this normalization it's always one so i guess we actually need this coordinate relative to our camera which makes sense so we actually have this this one is probably messing stuff up Thinking, thinking. So let's also print our camera. Camera origin, I guess. Camera 3D origin. Or transform origin. So he's also one. Can we just pass, let's just pass in the whole camera here, maybe. Let's do that. So we look at the camera, camera, and we don't need this look direction anymore, because we can just extract ourselves. Oopsies. Um, so we don't need this anymore, but we do need the camera. And we know our look direction is this. And, you know, really you should do this. We should do static font look direction from camera. Get the camera, and we call this on it. This. And then we call look direction from camera camera because we are doing this in multiple places and it is the same concept. So we're not just like factoring out because the code looks the same, but it is really just in fact the exact same concept. And that's really what's more important than keeping it dry, as people say. We pass in camera 3D. Okay, and so desired grid cord we now remove this look direction like this okay, i think we're chilling uh so what was why was i doing that because i wanted to get the neighbor direction is the grid cord to local cord minus camera uh this is camera dot transform dot origin or something Okay. Uh, so now I need to stop printing this here because it's flooding the logs. Restart. Nice. Nice. So we're seeing now almost perfectly aligned. And so now if I bring back that dot product, we should see it be uh, almost 1.0. Sometimes. 
So let's print here look direction dot neighbor direction. Um, first of all, he's moving backwards because I forgot to invert this. Okay, so sometimes it's like 2 pi. Uh, so let's do... So this is normalized. Did I forget to normalize somewhere? Yeah. Uh, so here we should do neighbor direction equals neighbor direction normalized. Perfect. So here we're seeing some like some negative ones, some ones. Okay, let's actually slow it down. We've moved it up. We've made it too fast. Right. So we have forward and backwards. Perfect. And here, we, when it's zero, it's like a left right. And here, it's negative one. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so if the dot product is near negative 1, then we should filter it out. So if look direction dot neighbor direction is greater than negative 0 0.95, we push back. Um, yeah, and the reason why uh, is because, what is it? Let's see, color paint. The reason we're doing it this way is if you have like vector A and vector B, the dot product is like essentially like the projection from like one to the other. So the dot product is like this value. So if A and B almost perfectly line up, this will be 1.0. If they're like inverted from each other, so you have like B and like a, this will be like negative 0.25 or something. Uh, and so basically I'm just trying to say, if we're looking like almost perfectly backwards, uh, of if, sorry, if the neighbor is almost perfectly backwards from us, uh, then we don't want it. And so I think, I think that's it. Can I get rid of all these prints? Nice. Oh, it didn't like something. Hmm. So even though the size... This didn't work the way I thought it would. Why not? Let's break point here and restart. Okay. Um... Let's print this before... Print... This and this. And let's just. Okay. Okay. Uh, or is it because, like, why sometimes here it's like 0.75? That's kind of weird. I would think it should be almost near, almost always near one or zero. Oh no, because it's I over two. Okay, what do I see here? Debugger. Where is my output? Here we go. So here I saw negative nine nine six and negative point nine eight six. How is that possible? Are we like moving in this time? There's no way, right? Like it should be constant. Okay, so we'll say, let's start printing out just everything. So we have the neighbor direction is neighbor direction. And we'll print the neighbor as well. 
and we'll print out the dot product. And we'll restart. Okay. Uh, we're printing some other stuff here that makes it kind of hard to parse, so we'll restart. Okay, let's look at this again. So we have... Oh, we should also probably uh, inject these. And then print here. Filtering. Like this. That way we can break it down by each grid space. Okay, so here we have basically straight on Z, so dot product is high. Then here we have basically backwards on Z, dot is low, okay, good. And here we have the same neighbor direction twice. Like, how is that possible for 0, 3, and 0, 1? That seems really bugged, right? Like, these should be different. Negative, negative. Um, so... What is my... I guess I should print my coordinate. Grid cord. Is it because I'm not updating my grid coordinate? So I have grid cord 01, and it says 02 and 11. Okay, let's wait for it to crash. Mm, this looks right so far. Why did this all of a sudden change? Maybe we got like a lucky seed. It also is not filtering correctly which is a sign that something's wrong. Right here, he's going, turning around instead of going forward. So I think maybe, maybe we haven't updated the grid coordinate early enough. Uh, right, because we only update the grid coordinate down here. Oh, but so that means at this point, we're, like, happy. Hmm. Um, I guess the fact that grid cord is... Neighbor is... Oh, sorry. Let's... Let's print the... Uh... Neighbor minus grid cord. Because this should always be... 0, 1, or 1, 0, or something along those lines. Okay. So there, why did this happen? We have dot... Oh, okay. Let's take a look. So, on our last thing, we have something that's like backwards on Z. The fact that these are the same is very odd to me. Oh, it's because I'm not, I'm, I'm looking at the camera position. No, that's right. So, okay, we gotta figure out how these two are be becoming the same. This is the odd part here. The fact that neighbor... Okay, so we're at grid cord 0, 3. And we have neighbor 0, 4. So zero, so with neighbor zero four, this should be a neighbor mask to position at zero one, right? Straightforward. forward. 
And yep, so that we see that we see zero one and zero negative one. So the fact that the direction for zero one and zero negative one are the same, that's the bug. Which means that this grid chord to local chord is also probably bugged. Uh, so let's make sure this stays on top so we can see what we're working on. Okay, so I guess we just go look at grid chord to local chord. Yeah, so we know that this is right. Um, so we make this smaller. Go to the maze. Here we go. And so chord X, chord Y, map to local, grid map, map to local. from chord. So let's, I guess, just print this out. Map to local. And we'll restart. What the? What just happened? Where am I? Maze, grid chord to local chord. Did I just break it? Where'd it go? Oh, I forgot to close that bracket. So now we just wait for a crash. Hurry up, please. Please. I guess I can just turn this up to like eight. Oh wow, that like hot reloads, that's kinda cool. And we'll just re-roll. Okay, here we go. So map to local one one three, right? Map to local one one negative one. Which means that that's confusing because I should be at like. Hmm. Is there like a double negative going on? Is there a double negative going on? So if I have zero, zero, negative one. Oi, 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 I feel like my brain's not working very well. The fact that I can't figure this out is hurting. Um. Oh, no, that makes sense. Because uh, the tiles are each too large. So this is too... So for this to be true, my camera must be at one one one. So this is two tiles forward, and this is two tiles backwards. Oh, uh, sorry, this is two tiles backwards. Okay. That makes sense. Oh, sorry. Wait. Yeah, yeah. Um, neighbor direction. So this is still where I get lost. Is how is this possible? Because I normalized it, and normalizing puts it in the range of zero to one. So I probably, but the length should be zero to one. Uh, let's print the pre-normalized direction. No normalize. All right. Aha. 
So we're kind of just getting lucky because one of them is 000, which is a bug. Okay, that's a really good sign. So let's take a look at that. Why would my neighbor direction Should this be plus? Because I have my direction plus the camera. That makes more sense. But he is so swinging back and forth. Okay. Um, no, normalize, no normalize okay let's slowly walk through this again let's make sure that our available neighbors are what we expect so our available neighbors oh neighbor masks oh this is stupid These are should these are not in grid space. Right? Like that's just what this means. Because here I've already matched them to positions. Neighbor mask. Oh no, that's that's grid space. So pick desired cord is all in grid space. Right, that makes sense. Okay. So I have the positions in grid space of the neighbors. Sure. And I filter out the backwards one. Like grid cord, available neighbors, maze, camera. Okay. So all of that lines up. Then for each neighbor, I subtract the grid cord. So I should have like neighbor minus grid cord should always be something sane, which I've checked here. Neighbor minus grid cord is zero, negative one. Great. Here, zero, one. Great. But then this like, the, the direction here is really far. So I think this is probably the problem. So first let's make sure. So I think this like local coordinate of the maze is actually, should probably be multiplied by relative to my pair. Hmm. Let's see what this is again. Um, so we go over here to maze, maze, and here we return the transform of myself. Okay, relative to my parent. So that means that after this, I should be in the parent space, which happens to be world space, like the parent world. The I should be in the space of my node, top level node. When I look at like maze walker I should be in this space. So I should now have the direction relative to zero, zero. Oh, I see. I see. So this probably, this trick is just probably not working. So let's just do, I should probably just get, it's a raw position relative to the camera position. Let's take a look at that. That should be more sane. Oh yeah, here we go. That looks like it's working. Oh my gosh, okay. Yeah, that's great. Look at the, look at him go. God, all of that. So I was just doing some like double conversions that I wasn't supposed to do. Oi, oi, oi. I make that mistake so often. Okay. But that's pretty sick. So let's slow him down again. What was he at? Three. And rotation step was probably like three. And restart him. Rotation still feels too fast. Maybe like two.
Like the whole thing feels too slow. May I want like speed two. And we should actually probably want like a constant speed, which is just 1.0. And I'll call this thing that I was calling speed before trans, uh, like move translation speed. And do, 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 do. where I previously had speed, I should remove this. And in fact, I should just make sure that everything compiles without speed in there at all. Okay, and now I can add this back and multiply this by speed. There are now like the rotation and the translation will be good relative to each other. And here, let's take a look. He walks too slow, so we bump this up to like one point, maybe 2.0. And maybe, maybe like 1.5 here. So then the whole thing is going slow, so I can just like double the speed here. Too fast. Slow it down. I actually still think the rotation speed's too hot fast. Or too slow. Hmm, this looks like it's broken again, actually. He shouldn't be... Didn't I fix that behavior? I thought I fixed this. What happened? It was working so well. What changed? He shouldn't be able to get stuck bouncing back and forth forever. I thought it was fixed. Hmm. Stop. Play. Yeah, this is fixed. I don't understand. I do not understand. What did I break? Maybe it was never working and I just thought it was. Oh, it's because he's just getting stuck in this, like, rotation step thing, maybe? Um... So here, I probably just call this something small, like... Okay. <laughs> no. Why is this not working? So here I'm getting stuck doing something stupid. Where am I getting stuck? So if I open the debugger, I just pause. I can like look at my backtrace maybe. No. Okay, if I just undo a few times and go back to here. What's crazy is it was working here. And if I do this, Does it still work? Yes, this was very, very, very clearly working here. Because he never turned around. Yeah, he's just going the right direction. Boom, boom, boom. So how come speeding it up or changing the ratio of rotation speed to translation speed was breaking this at all? So I think I was doing like this, maybe? It's still too fast. I must have made a mistake when I... I must have typed something that I didn't want to. 
Okay, whatever. We should just checkpoint. Make sure that we don't break any break anything. Ah, that took an hour. I thought that was gonna be really quick. I thought it was gonna be like a 15 minute attempt, but I guess. Uh when there's a bug, there's a bug. Okay. So let's remove these print statements that we don't need. And all of these are just kind of cluttering stuff up. And let's go over to the um I think I put it in the maze script. I had another print over here that I don't need. There we go. And if I restart, my output should be clean, other than this filtering that it's printing over and over again. Save, restart. Let's just watch him for a while to make sure he's still going in the right direction. Okay. Look at him go. That's kind of nice. Kind of nice. So now... We just commit. Checkpoint... Movement without going backwards. Working. There we go. Why didn't my terminal size change? Oh, because it was uh, going on top. All right. This is done. Achieved. So we have fixed the path, path planning. And next up is start and end location success screen okay so that means what we have we actually already have a start and end location uh in our map generation so the way the map generation algorithm works is i take like a grid of points do 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 do, 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 do. Drawing some lines, lines, lines. Okay, horizontal. So it picks a random point, I think. I have to double check this. And then it just kind of like walks around. Do, do, do. Do, 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 do. And then it goes like, oh no, I hit a dead end. And then he goes back and he goes, oh, there's some more places to go over here. Dead end. Goes back. Ooh, more stuff to do. Dead end. Comes all the way back. Goes back, 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 back. Fills this guy in. So every point in the grid gets filled in. Uh, but what we could probably do is we could just say the first dead end we hit, or maybe the last dead end we hit. No, the first dead end we hit is likely very deep. And so we could just say, like, this right here, this is the goal. And then when we make it to the goal, we'll, like, just re-roll the map. So the question is, how can we easily implement this? So I guess in our map class, we will um, we'll make some sub goals here. In the map class, so marks the start and end. And in the game class, checks if we are at end. Uh, game class starts us at start. I don't know, this isn't the game class anymore. This is the walker class. And on finish, restart the scene. And then we implement, like, a scene transition. Okay. So... The start and end thing is really easy to do. So in... Oh gosh, it's so hard to find stuff. Map data. We just mark var start pause and end pause. Here, when we generate the map, we 
randomly initialize our start position. So we can just return map, start, pause, end, pause here. And then our end position has to be the first time we go back. Um, so we set, first we'll set our initial end position to null. And here, if end pause is null, end pause is the position. And then when we call generate map, oh, it doesn't like this. Do I need to put it in an array? Does like that. So now when I call the generation, maze generation, I can just say grid start pause and pause is the output of this function. Only identifier, attribute access, and subscription access can be used as a target. I don't know what that means. Oh. Is there no like structured binding? Um, Godot tuple unpack, or I should say array unpack. Godot list unpack. Unpacking array into an argument list, blah, 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 blah. Closing duplicate. This is closed. Why was this closed? Completed. Um. Let's see. Oh, this is splatting. This is not what we want. That's okay. This guy doesn't need to be open over here. In fact, this doesn't even need to be open at all. Okay. So I guess they don't have list unpacking, which means that I'll just call this var res and grid res zero. Start pause is res1 and end pause is res2. Not ideal, but good enough. It is plenty good enough. Okay, so what is next? What is next? This should be done, but we need to actually test it. So probably what we can just do is in the grid class. Mm, the walker we can just on ready first we'll set the position to maze.map start pause <laughs> that's not good <laughs> uh that's not good at all let's go back to how it was before ah Grid cord is maze start map start pause. There we go. Still no good. No good at all. In fact, I'm just like walking at an angle. That was weird. Um. Oh, because grid cord equals our initial state has to be that we're at our desired position. Otherwise, we'll try to walk to zero, zero, zero. Okay, there we go. So we started somewhere. We'll play again. And let's just print our grid cord on ready for full confirmation. Zero, 10. Okay, that's good. And let's print the target position as well. Map, just maze, map, and pause. Yep, yeah, okay, so we have a target position now. Very cool. And here, let's assert that we're not at the end position, which means that our program will crash when we finish, and then we'll know that we are able to get there. Um, so let's just like crank our speed up to like 12 so that we can see us wander through the halls. And then we can put our in physics process, we can just say assert grid cord is not equal to maze map and pause. And we restart and we just rapidly run through. Okay, so this is interesting. We've we're back at that bug from before. If our speed is too high, it looks like some of our like logic falls over. Yeah, that's interesting. So we'll have to take a look at that later. But for now, 
Let's just see if he eventually finds it. Oh, that's funny. Our end position is actually one right next to our start position, but behind the wall. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. It's kind of fun to watch. Let's see if he figures it out. I guess maybe I should just print my position so I can see if I'm getting closer. Oh, uh, here. We'll just print it over and over. And let's try cranking up the speed a little bit. Because I don't like watching it so slow. Okay, so above six, it doesn't like. What an annoying bug. I'll have to look at that later. Oh, I don't know my end position because I'm printing too much. No, come back. Oh, it's because I, I don't like rapidly printing. I only want to print when I have reached a position that will keep it manageable. So I'm looking for 9-2. Okay. Okay. We'll make it there eventually. I guess I could also make the maze smaller, and then I wouldn't have to wait so long. Or I could make the algorithm for walking, like, smarter, but I don't want to do that. Okay. So here we should find it pretty quick. He went the wrong way, and so I think that here he needs to go straight. No! Go back! <laughs> what an awful way to test. What an absolutely awful... Turn left, turn left, turn left. Yes! Perfect. Okay. So when we get to the end, we crash, which means that our start and end pause are marked correctly. And we have initialized to the start position. Great. Um, we now just have to check... Uh, we have to, like, find a way to intelligently restart this. So I think there's a way to, like, reload the scene in Godot. I think. Um. There's a way to, like, switch scenes. I can probably just switch scenes to myself. Q3. Instancing scenes. Bar scene is load this. Um, I can add a scene as a child, but I want to like replace myself. Go you know, replace current scene. Sometimes it's blah blah blah. We can delete the existing scene. Change scene to file. Changes the running scene to the one at the given path. Okay, that's useful. That is useful. We can move the scene, blah, blah, blah. There are also cases where we, where we might have to, we might want several scenes. Uh, but yeah, that seems reasonable. I wonder if there's a way, can I like replace my scene for myself? GD script get current node path or something? Um, this is like the path type, but I want to get like my current path. How do you get the node path from a function? Or GD script restart scene. Reload the current scene. There must be like some just API call to. What? All right. That sounds like what I want. So we just say if grid cord is the maze end position then we reload the current scene okay and let's see if he does it so when he finds the end we should get a new map oh no he's going backwards <laughs> 
Yep, that's the start again, buddy. You'll get there. <laughs> We've been this way. <laughs> this is really infuriating to watch. <laughs> I'm gonna lose my mind. I actually don't even know what the end is supposed to be. 3 1. Have we been at 3 1? We definitely have, so we should leave this assertion in. Yeah, okay, so this reload is not working correctly. I guess I can just call ready again. Let's just see. Oh, but that won't regenerate the map. It will not regenerate the map. But that's okay. Oh, and also, maybe nothing regenerates the map. So maybe I want... Maybe I have to force a map regeneration. Hmm. I'm on... This feels wrong. I'm going to note that. I just want to, like... Maybe if I delete the scene... I got okay, let's leave this as is and let's Yeah, we should teleport if this is actually reloaded. So what does that reload current scene do? Let's take a look at that. Reloads the active scene. What does reloading mean though? I want to rerun ready and like reset up the scene. Uh good oh reload. I bet actually I bet that there's some sort of, like, intelligent garbage collection going on, and it, we know that, like, if I reload my scene, maybe it doesn't think that it needs to, like, regenerate the map. So let's just force a regeneration and see if that fixes it. Which means my maze class needs to have a function called uh, regenerate map, or, like, yeah, regenerate. And that just calls ready, I think. Okay. And then in my walker, I call maze regenerate ready up again. Return. Let's see it. So here, when I get to the end, I should get a reroll. Come on, turn left, turn left, turn left. Yep. No? I actually can't tell. We should see, like, a teleportation at some point. With no turnaround. Yeah, there we go. And so, actually, probably here, we actually want to set our initial direction, our, like, initial look direction, to be, like, the f something sane. What I'm actually okay with it starting facing backwards, that doesn't actually harm this that much. Especially if I have, like, a game end screen, it'll become really obvious that we've restarted. Okay. So I guess also we yeah there there we just finished. Sweet. Okay. So on finish, restart the scene. Success. And here we can just remove these prints now. Restart again. He's still printing a lot. It's these ones that I want to get rid of as well. No prints. We're chilling. Let's put this back in the corner. Uh, probably I also need to flag visually. Visually flag a scene. Flag the final destination. So in the original, they added this like scene with like a globe and some Lego, I think. Windows 95 maze screen saver. See, they just had, like, this guy and this guy. Um, 
which means that I I can do something similar. But it also means that I'm going to need like a texture that I swap out. Which means that I have to learn in Godot how to swap textures manually. Which is fine. Godot swap textures. Change texture. Okay, so there's some textures. Let's like look at the mesh. Or I guess we can like look at. Actually, let's checkpoint here. I want to make sure that this is not lost. And we'll call this finishes, maze, and restarts. And let's actually make the maze the right size again. We'll slow them down. And where was the size of this? Here. Play. Here we go. Put them in the corner while we do some reading. Uh, okay. Think time. We want to swap out the texture on the back wall of the dead end, specifically on the end position, which shouldn't be that hard. We just have to find the call. So probably we can find it in this like mesh library scene. Let's just like look at what this guy has on him. So he's got a mesh. This mesh has predefined materials that I can't change. But I can probably modify one of them. So if I if I subclass this like fixed resource in the glb file that I was exported from Blender. Instantiate child scene. I have to search something. Can't I like create a new one? Add child scene. Here we go. So at the dead end, I can add a child scene. Call it node three. Oh, that's not what I want. Is it? Maybe it is. Uh, no, that's not what I want. So here I have new inherited scene from here. I want a new inherited scene from this. Um, so can I, no. Right, so I can inherit from the GLB. Maybe I do need to make a new inherited scene from this. Can I like copy, paste this to like here? Hey, okay. Oh, but the mesh is still fixed. So that's not what I want. Delete nodes. Can I, oh, what happened here? That's not good. Oh, this also, this also is not the text, the library. So I actually need something in the maze, the maze class has this grid map that uses the mesh library, right? So the hierarchy is, we have Blender over here. We'll make Blender orange. Blender. And we have Godot over here. Godot. Blender makes a GLB file that has the meshes in it. Godot instanti takes this and has a mesh scene. This mesh scene is exported to a mesh library in Godot. 
And then we use that library in the grid. So where I set my texture up, this is where I'm going to be programmatically be using it. But maybe I actually have to do something here to make that doable. But we'll figure that out later. Let's start here. Or maybe I have to like, like alter the imported GLB in here somewhere. We cannot modify this from Godot. We can only modify it from Blender. So what would this look like here? It would look like we would find somewhere where we can inherit the mesh itself. When we export the mesh, we have this like inherited version that has like custom materials on it that we can modify from code. Or maybe we already have that ability. And from here, we actually just have to call in. So I think this is where we need to start looking. We need to see what kind of APIs we have on the grid to affect the mesh. And then we can go from there. Another option here is if we want an end screen, we could actually just leave the brick texture there and just draw our finish scene in front of it. That would work. Uh, but that's not as fun. So let's let's take a look and just let's just see. Let's explore. And what, what happens will happen. Uh, so let's look at maze. We have a grid map. And let's look at the documentation for grid map. So we have a mesh library. can use a list of tiles. Blah, blah, blah. We can get the mesh for each. Well, is a mesh? So I guess it's unclear to me. Um... If a mesh has textures on it, or if a mesh is just the geometry and textures are applied after. So let's take a look and see what's actually in here. So in our grid map, we have a mesh library. And we each library has an item. And in here, we have shadows surfaces oh okay and maybe we can just like edit the surface here let's take a look <coughs> right so if i just turn on the emission here okay so we can in fact edit we can edit the mesh real time so that's good um so maybe what we do is we Create a new material for the back wall on the dead end. We name it bricks or finish. And then on that specific tile, we can maybe edit. What's um, what's odd here is that the mesh library, if I change the material, it will change for all of them. Um, so I guess I will probably have to spin up a different version of the library. That's probably easiest, honestly. If we just duplicate the mesh and assign a different material to the back wall. Hopefully everything's smart enough to share geometry. Not that it matters. These are like eight point polygons. Like, it doesn't matter. That's the easiest way to get it to work. And I know that that'll work because what I'm worried about here is that um, that I if I want to change the material, I can't do it on a specific instance in the grid uh, because if what the grid is doing is it's just like taking the mesh data and dropping it at individual locations, then it might actually not support spawning a like separate thing in one cell. So what I could do, there are like two things I could do there is I could not instantiate the wall at that position and do it myself and copy out the mesh and instance a new one, whatever. Um, or I could just support having a different material. I could I could support having like an end tile. And I think that's that's the easiest way to do it. And I really, really shouldn't be caring about performance in this at all. This thing's so simple. Um, so let's try that. So here I'll duplicate with Alt D instead of Shift D in Blender. Uh, which means, which says like, pretty please, could you share the mesh when you duplicate? Don't don't copy the data, just copy the instantiation. And we'll call this finished dead end. 
or we'll just call this finish maybe. And here we split out a new material, so we call this uh, back, or we call this finish. We assign this here, and actually, we don't actually need to do anything here. Oh, uh, because we've shared these. <laughs> uh, so we also have to set the material to be attached to the object. Here we delete this, and we here assign this like this. Okay. So now that in this one we've attached it to the object, we can create a new material. Um, object. So dead end is attached to mesh, but this one's attached to the object. Here we have a new... This is the ceiling. This is the floor. No, this is the finish and we on this guy set this to this and so now the dead end should be all bricks no because why not why not oh because maybe the assignment of the maybe assignment of faces is still a tied to the mesh oh well, let's see if i go in here I send it to bricks. And I go in here. Yeah, I am editing both of these at once. So probably each face in Blender has like a material ID on it. That's just my guess. And what I could actually do is I could say this back wall goes to material ID 3, if we're zero indexed. And in the dead end version of this, these should both be tied to object. Here in the dead end version of this, I can attach this to the bricks. So now I've got shared geometry, but different materials. Why the hell are these? Oh. I should be worried about the fact that this looks different, right? That's fucked. Is it on both sides? No, it's only... What the heck? Okay, something's wrong there. But, as usual, I'm not going to care about it for now. Um, let's export this collection. And we will re-import it in Godot in a second. So this, if I go to Godot, it goes, wow, I have to report. Then I need to re-export my tile map. Hello, Godot. It crashed. Very cool. It's fine. We weren't doing anything useful anyways. I didn't want to use you. Okay, so now if I look at the finish, I have a white wall at the back, good. And now I can re-export this mesh library. And then when I construct the maze, I use finish for that tile. So here when I look up the mesh, when I do like the mesh lookup in my maze construction. Right now I'm only looking at the mask to get the mesh, but now I can also say uh, if it's the end position we can assume it's a dead end because hmm, I think so. Because I think that the way the, the map construction works, it will be the it will be marked as the end the first time we get to an unvisited node. And it ha the unvisited node would have four closed walls until that point. 
it is kind of interesting that I don't think I can punch holes through from another side, but I think that's okay. Um, okay, so here I just have to say, um, here instead of only getting it from the open wall mask, I can say if xz vector to xz vector to i, this is an integer vector, if this is the same as the map end position, continue, and here instead of, we still need to get the orientation, so I'll actually still get this. We swap the mesh for mesh lookup finish. Okay, so now we go back down to a uh, small map. And we increase the speed again. And we restart. And hopefully we see... There we go. Nice. When we find the ends, we know the ends on the right. Boom, baby. <clears throat> That's sick. Boom. Oh, that feels good. Okay, so now all I have to do is just replace that finish screen with something like a little smiley face or something. And then we're done. Maybe I'll handle the scene transition later. It depends on if I want to do more work right now. Or how I want to do that. I think that this is going to require like a small amount of research. I just need to like do some Googling and I think it'll be faster if I Google off screen and then come back ready to implement. So let's put this down here. Call this done. Right? That's actually hot tip if you're trying to finish work. If you just keep decreasing scope of the work till what you've already done is it, then you can feel really good about yourself without actually doing anything. Huge, huge win. Uh, so let's do that. We've done this. Let's commit. We'll say um, visual finish complete. Or poorly done visual finish, I say. Poorly done visual finish complete. Oh, and let's fix the uh, speed here. And the maze size. So this was 16 by 16 originally. Okay. Put this in the corner. Um, yeah. So I think that's probably good enough for today. Uh, next time I want to start looking at making my own procedural material here. I think I've got an idea of how to get that done. Um... I think that we're... I'm pretty happy with where we got to today. Uh, we didn't really do much, it feels like. But we were working the whole time. What the hell was that? Oh, that's funny. Uh, <laughs> so, I don't know if you guys saw that. But on the back wall... So, since the uh, front and back of these guys line up perfectly. And I didn't turn on back face culling for this... For one of them. For this material here. Uh, it actually was rendering the back wall through. So let's just quickly fix that. That's an easy fix. So that's here for material four. I turn off back, I turn, oh, back face calling is on here, but it's not on on this one. There we go. So let's just quickly fix that because that's annoying and I don't want, I'm gonna forget about that and it's gonna come up and then someone in chat, if anybody ever watches, will be like, hey, why are your, why is your, code full of bugs and that'll be embarrassing right we wouldn't want that <laughs> it's so ugly so let's just quickly fix that so i re-export the meshes go over back into godot from blender re the automatically re-import so now i can just go back into the scene and i can export as a mesh library okay and i think if i restart the game here hopefully that fixes it 
we'll see if it comes back later. Uh, status, git add dash u, git commit. Poor man's visual finish complete. So what was I saying? Uh, what did we do today is we fixed the path planning so that he always goes forward. We spent a lot of time working. We spent a lot of time dealing with uh, coordinate space transforms and working in the wrong coordinate space, resulting in weird, hard to diagnose bugs. Um, then we added a start and end to the maze and visually adjusted the mesh so that when we find the end, uh, we could see it. And we reinstantiate the scene, start over from scratch, teleport to the new start location. Uh, yeah, it's pretty good. So I think next stream, uh, we're in a place where, like, this is watchable now, I think. I think that I can, like, keep this on the side and we'll see progress. Um, but what, it looks wrong. And so either next stream I'll probably spend some time generating new procedural textures and kind of making this look a little better. Probably I want to also do some, like, post-processing here. Uh, yeah, so stay tuned. Catch you next time. Thanks.